Hello, my name is Drew McCachron, and welcome to the 10-Foot Pole Podcast. Thank you to Joseph Long for our theme song. In the mainstream imagination, ever since the end of the Cold War, communism has often been seen as a relic of the past consigned to the dustbin of history. Despite this, because of current economic crises around the world, people are beginning to turn to once-rejected ideas for guidance, including communism and Marxism. Uh, Many thinkers today can be described as neo- or post-Marxists, reinterpreting elements of Marxist thought and rejecting the legacies of historically communist nations. However, there are those who do support the legacies of these historical communist nations and more orthodox Marxist thought. One such group would be the Revolutionary Student Movement, which follows a Marxist-Leninist-Maoist approach to communism. And here with us is the chairperson of the technically unofficial UPEI chapter of the RSM, Nova Arsenault. Hello. Hi. (laughs) Yeah. So now I guess we should probably start the conversation, you know, with a more localized influence of what is the revolutionary student movement. Absolutely. Um, So I guess first we should start with the history of the revolutionary student movement so we can see uh, what it actually came out of. Um, It emerged from the student movement in the Montreal area, um, from the student strikes that happened there, and from the critique of the social democratic movement that existed in Ottawa and also from the communist student work in Ontario that happened after the Second Canadian Revolutionary Congress in 2010 in Toronto. Um, So an important basis of RSM is the acknowledgement of the multi-class nature of schools and of the student movement. Um, This means that we recognize that there's class antagonism on campus and that universities educate students in a way that upholds capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, patriarchy, racism, and other forms of exploitation. Um, just because it emerges from this capitalist state. Um, So we acknowledge that working class students have been disproportionately affected by um, certain austerity measures such as tuition hikes and budget cuts uh, that have been on the rise ever since the economic crisis of 2008. And we know that the struggle for access to education should be fought because it's in the interests of all working class students. Many people... Many people today don't seem to know a lot of the theory elements of, you know, Marxist thought, which obviously a group like yours is rather theoretically oriented as well as practically oriented. Would that be correct in saying? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So maybe we can start the conversation further to kind of give context to that explanation by kind of going through the theory of Marxism and what it means and why, because of that, it's important and why a group like the RSM is, in your view, necessary on a campus like UPEI. Uh, Would I be correct in saying that the RSM follows a more Marxist-Leninist-Maoist approach to communist thought? Um, Yeah, at the, perhaps you could say, the upper levels of the organization, it is a Marxist-Leninist-Maoist organization. Um, But more generally speaking, the only real criteria for membership is um, a working-class background and an anti-capitalist sentiment and also an agreement to... uh, to abide by the anti-racist, um, pro-feminist, that sort of thing that mm. exists in our uh, in our mandate. Okay. So I guess we should start with Marxist-Leninist-Maoism and go to the very beginning, Marxism. For those who don't know, how would you describe Karl Marx and Marxism? Uh, well, Karl Marx was, among other things, he was a philosopher, um, and he wanted to gain an understanding of how... Um, how the political economy worked, um, and from a philosophical standpoint, he drew ideas from um, from Hegelian dialectics, um, and also from existing capitalist um, economist thinkers like um, Ricardo. Ricardo. Yeah, um, and Smith, and Smith as well. Yes, that's the other one I was trying to think of. Um, and basically, he uh, he critically analyzed all of these different components of existing philosophy in order to come to a more correct understanding of what's actually happening. Okay. Um, a lot of Marxist thought deals with, you mentioned the word dialectics, and am I correct in saying that Marxist dialectics uh, 
an important feature of that that is important for understanding it is base and superstructure. Um, yes, uh, that is one component of dialectics, but that's not, um, it's not traditionally a part of Marxist dialectics. That's actually more of like a structuralist approach that comes after Marxism. Okay. Um, but it is a dialectical approach to examining society, um, okay. the base and superstructure dynamic. Okay. For those who don't know, what is dialectics and what does it attempt to describe? Um, well, dialectics uh, basically means examining contradictions between, uh, between ideas and also within a particular idea. Uh, we can see dialectical philosophy from pre-Marx and even from pre-Hegelian dialectics. Uh, if we look at the Socratic method, that's a dialectic method of argument. Um, if you look at the ancient um, Chinese board game Go, as it's commonly known, or Wei Qi, I think it's supposed to be called, um, that is also actually uses a dialectical um, pattern to contradict the enemy's movements and, and remove him from the board. Um, so essentially it involves examining the contradictions within a particular thing in order to gain um, an understanding of its development and where it comes from and where it's going. Um, the difference would be that um, Marx looked at Hegelian dialectics, which was what you'd call um, idealist dialectics, which is the idea that our, our perception and our minds shape the external world um, and that it goes from the mind to the outside world, whereas Marxism is dialectical materialism. So we examine how the material world shapes the mind, and then in turn the mind's understanding of the material world allows us to reshape the material world. Okay. How, keeping that in mind, how would you explain the Marxist idea behind class and class conflict? Um, well, we can sort of look at the economy, um, the political economy, as being a particular thing, but its nature is generated by contradictions that exist within it. So there's an exploiting class that owns the property and um, exploits labor, the, the labor power of workers. And then there are the workers who have to exist within this system in order to subsist and have to subject themselves to a certain amount of exploitation in order to be able to get um, the means of subsisting. And this is the thing that, uh, that drives capitalism, is this contradiction between the two classes. Um, and that's, that's basically the nature of class antagonism. It is a, a dialectical process. Okay. And the basic idea behind Marxism is that the capitalism, which is itself a result of historical contradictions between old, among older systems of economic things, right? Feudalism and mercantilism, their contradictions gave rise to capitalism, correct? Yeah. yeah. And the contradictions in capitalism give rise to the bourgeoisie, this exploiting class you mentioned, mm. and the proletariat, the working class, the laboring class that is exploited, and that these tensions themselves will undermine capitalism and pave the way for socialism or communism, correct? Yes, yeah. Um, in, I guess you could say, like traditional Marxist thought, it was sort of implied that um, capitalism is uh, sort of destined for failure because it thrives yeah. on the thing that contradicts itself. Um, now, as, as practitioners of communism, we have to recognize that it's not just going to do it itself. We have to actually, um, we have to do the thing in order yeah. for the contradiction to happen. And I think that leads us into the second part of that Marxist-Leninist Maoist tripartite we mentioned, which is Leninism. Who is Vladimir Lenin? Well, Vladimir Lenin um, was a revolutionary in Russia. Um, he was the leader of the, um, the RSDLP, the... Uh, Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, I blanked on the name for a second, um, and essentially his contributions to Marxism was that um, he looked at how Marx had sort of stated that capitalism um, was, the, the structure of capitalism was unstable and that it would eventually topple itself, and he contradicted this by looking at the rise of imperialism. Um, so in his book, Imperialism, the Highest Age of Capitalism, he looks at how um, capitalism, instead of becoming structureless and falling apart has actually um, concentrated in banks and in other forms of monopoly capitalism um, to finance war and to uh, to basically exponentially propagate yeah. the ex exploitation of the working class. Basically, instead of basic... So basically taking the contradictions between the working class and the bourgeoisie within a society and kind of easing that tension by creating like almost a national disparity between imperialist countries and more developing countries that 
Am I correct in saying that, or is that more kind of Wallerstein's interpretation? I think that that's not quite necessarily part what of Lenin's. Lenin's yeah. Yeah. Um, Lenin's idea was basically just that, um, uh, that yes, like capitalism, instead of being uh, deconstructed by itself, it's actually tended toward a, a higher amount of structure in okay. smaller groups of people and okay. in smaller institutions, um, and that this has created... Uh, a tendency toward war because it's um, made other contradictions between other nations. So there's a part of that that is yeah. correct, yeah. Um, there's sort of imperialism and the imperialization of opposing nations. Yeah, and then that led to Lenin's conception of the vanguard party, correct? Like a revolutionary vanguard party of the proletariat, correct? Uh, yeah, I, th I think that it was. it's definitely implied in Marx's yeah. writing that a vanguard party is uh, is necessary. There needs to be some sort of leadership behind that, um, but Lenin successfully created the vanguard. Um, if you look at, say, the Paris Commune, which was what Marx took a lot of inspiration from, um, there wasn't really a concerted authority structure within the Commune. They sort of established the Commune and then didn't properly defend it um, because it didn't have a proper leadership structure. So looking at that, um, Lenin was also able to determine that there needs to be some sort of centralized structure, and this is where we get the idea of uh, democratic centralism. And following from Lenin, obviously, led to the foundation of the Soviet Union, and then Lenin was, to, to summarize, well, to reduce history a little bit, was followed by Stalin and was eventually re uh, replaced by Khrushchev, correct? And then there were splits in the communist world after that, correct? And some people started to look towards Mao. Um, yeah, to as as to a very reduced. Very quickly, yeah, there yeah. was there was always splits even during um, yeah. Lenin's time because pre USSR there was also uh, the Bolshevik Menshevik split yeah. with the Bolsheviks wanting to uh, to use authority and keep their guns that the state yeah. was trying to take from them. The Mensheviks trying to take a more um, what we call now democratic socialist approach yeah. and try to elect themselves in as the revolutionary government. Um, but yeah, there were always a, system, yeah. a series of splits and it went from Lenin being leader to Stalin being leader to Khrushchev and um, the contradiction between Khrushchev and Mao leading to uh, um, Mao coming, I guess, uh, to the, to the yeah, front as the revolutionary. Yeah, the whole purpose behind Marxist-Leninist Maoism being kind of a turn away from Khrushchev and the Soviet Union's idea of communism at that time period towards the Maoist interpretations of communism, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the more Maoist structure of, of socialism, because yeah. Khrushchev um, did things with the structure of the state that removed the idea of class struggle. Yeah. Um, he sort of asserted that class struggle was, was done and that it no longer needed to be a proletarian state, um, and Mao recognized that class struggle continues within the socialist state. Okay, so for those who don't know, who is Mao Zedong? Uh, Mao Zedong was a, uh, a revolutionary leader in China. He eventually was um, the leader of the Communist Party of China that uh, that established the People's Republic of China in uh, 1949. Um, and he established a lot of newer ideas after Leninism because Leninism was, um, you could say it was insurrectionist. It was this idea that you can have a, a general strike and halt uh, production so that the state starts to shut down and then just step in with an army and take the state. Um, and it worked in Russia, but Russia had a very, very specific situation. And so Mao formulated the idea of, uh, of people's war, um, which is applicable to pretty much any situation. It recognizes it as a dialectical process and not just a specific moment where you jump in and take the state. Hmm. Okay, so... I was reading some things online from the Revolutionary Communist Party and was talking a little bit about this concept of people's war and kind of distinguishing distinguishing, distinguishing between the more general universalized concept of people's war and a more specific concept of people's war. Are you able, for those who are kind of confused by the term, able to maybe articulate what the purpose of people's war would be and kind of and this is obviously quite difficult because it's very due to specifics, right? But what shape it would take or what is n involved in a people's war? Yeah, definitely. Um, generally, uh, the idea of protracted people's war as opposed to a more simpler version of people's war. Protracted people's war looks at um, 
I guess the process would be there's a step of um, accumulation of forces where you're you know you're educating the masses, you're getting them to take part in communist activity and that sort of thing, um, until eventually there is a, a concerted effort against the capitalist system that takes place within them, um, and you move from this accumulation of forces into what's called um, a strategic defensive. So you are sort of um, taking small base areas within cities or countrysides, okay. and uh, and working toward an equilibrium and defending those areas. And then eventually an offensive once this equilibrium is kind of matched. Between... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Once the capitalist state and um, and the communist forces are sort of at an equilibrium, you yeah. try to make the jump into the offensive to eventually push the capitalist forces back. Um, and it's it is a dialectical process. It's examining how. Uh, the communist forces can contradict the existing capitalist forces until eventually um, there is no capitalist force. Because if you really look at it, the communist forces come from capitalism. We're, yeah. we're driven by capitalism to, to fight capitalism. So kind of using the alienated classes of capitalism and kind of trying to remove the elements of capitalism that gave rise to those... Uh, yeah, sort of. Place? Um, essentially... Uh, what is it that Marx says? Um, capitalism has, has trained its own grave diggers, I'm paraphrasing. But essentially, um, because of the exploitation that the working class, which is the vast majority of people, it's not just a, a small group of alienated people, um, because of that exploitation that they all uh, encounter, whenever they reach a certain state of class consciousness where they understand what, where that exploitation comes from, they will be driven to fight against capitalism as long as they don't have some kind of vested interest in its existence. A word that crops up in Maoist thought is new democracy. Is Would you be able to explain that concept, and is that a concept that is applicable to the kind of thought of modern-day Marxist-Leninist Maoism? Um, yeah, I'll try to exam or, uh, explain that a little bit. Um, see, in Russia, whenever there was the, uh, the Russian Revolution in October, um, what happened was that they already had a sort of democratic republic of sorts, even though they still had monarchism, um, they had some form of democracy that was recognizable and the people were familiar with. So they didn't need to have a democratic stage before their socialist revolution. But in China, because it was such a, a feudal country that was a victim of co colonialism and imperialism, um, they had a lot of peasantry that had never experienced democracy, and they had to uh, sort of have a democratic stage where they have... Um, a pre-socialist revolution that instates democracy, and then in turn they can take the newly formed democratic state and turn it into a socialist democratic state. Okay. What would a uh, socialist democratic state look like? Oh, that's hard to... <laughs> there's a tough one. Um, essentially, there's the idea of democratic centralism, um, which can be summarized as um, freedom of dissent but unity of action. So all of the working class people who are involved in the democratic decision, which is essentially anybody who's willing to take part, um, they all get their say, they all get to voice their frustrations or their contradictions with what's being discussed. Um, and that goes on for as long as is necessary, but once the conclusion is reached, everyone is supposed to act in unity to work toward um, the agreed upon conclusion until the next time that it needs to be discussed. Um, so at a, at a top level, that is how that works. Um, but essentially, the socialist state, uh, instead of it being elected representatives who are democratically elected and then they decide things for the people, um, there is a vanguard party that leads the people, um, and their members can be recalled if they need to be recalled by the people. And the people uh, have, their, have their democratic opinions voiced on the issues instead of just on who's going to represent them on those particular issues. Okay. I think that there's a few different ways we can take this now, and I'm trying to figure out which way is the best. But maybe, to go back to something you said, one of the purposes of a vanguard party is to educate the masses, correct? Yes, yes. So, a term that also crops up a lot of the time in Marxist thought or dialogue is the term ideology. And most people kind of have a... I don't know how I'd describe it, a more technical understanding of the term ideology as basically just any kind of theoretical framework through which you see things. In this sense, 
communism is an ideology as much as democracy is an ideology as much as fascism is an ideology but i but would i be correct in saying that in marxist thought and dialogue ideology has a different meaning from this um sort of yeah yeah essentially um a lot of ideologies like a capitalist ideology or a fascist ideology are going to present the ideas of that ideology as being what is absolutely real. Um, they don't necessarily give you the tools to examine those things, but they give you what they need to be the truth in order for their idea to work. Um, but the I ideology of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is dialectical historical materialism. Um, so essentially, communist ideology gives involves giving the people the tools that they need to examine their conditions so that the um, the truths, I guess you could say, that are given forth by the ideology can change as the situation changes. So it's not a, a static kind of ideology that's pushed upon people, but it's a set of ideological tools that they can use to, um, to find what it is that's true so that they can uh, work toward change. Is it also correct in saying that a lot of the Marxist critique of ideology also says that ideology just doesn't work at the very... Uh, kind of broad surface level function in society so you know most people like read a work of political theory and go that's an ideology mm. would it is it correct in saying that a marxist would also say that there are ideological forces that are hidden such as in the structure of society like a capitalist society that would you know kind of shape or direct uh, how people view society, kind of false consciousness or like the necessity of educating the masses on class conflict or class identity that some yeah. forces try to obscure. Yeah, we would, uh, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head with the false consciousness bit, which is, um, like I said, capitalist ideology kind of just forces its own values onto individuals um, so that they will work within that system um, in a way that benefits capitalism and keeps it going. And part of our our duty as communists is to try to unravel that so that people can reach a state of class consciousness. Um, so that instead of just accepting what they're being given, they they have the tools to dismantle that idea. Okay. Uh, usually when we're talking about ideology is kind of like this. Uh, ideology is kind of a criticized word in some ways and that people suggest that it is somehow not real. So if I were to take a more idealist approach, I could say ideology is just some kind of structure that we can put on to organize our social views. So in that case, you know, what's the difference between a capitalist ideology or a socialist ideology in that regard? And I'm wondering, in that, you know, sometimes it can almost become too idealist or too subjective in a way, that if it's, you look at it just in terms of a mental construction that shapes society for people. How do you argue between those things? And I know in Engel's work, am I correct in saying this is kind of where Engels tries to subvert that criticism in his socialism, utop scientific and utopian, or is it utopian and scientific? Uh, socialism, utopian and scientific. Yeah, where he kind of distinguishes this utopian socialism with the more scientific socialism of Marxism. Yeah, yeah, definitely, because before Engels' time, um, there was definitely an uh, idealist kind of socialism that existed, which you could, I guess, say it was more Hegelian than Marxist. Um, and it was just this idea that as long as we change the way that we think about things, we can change the things. Um, and I think, I think Marx said it best. He said, uh, the philosophers have interpreted the, wor the world in various ways, but the point is to change it. Um, so that's, that's where the ideology of Marxism points to, is that it's not just um, ideology, but it's an ideological tool to get you moving and understanding how things can be changed. Yeah. Can you maybe clarify more about how... Marxism is scientific, or how the dial dialectic is scientific? Yeah, definitely. Um, it, uh, it examines the progression of particular things based on their history and based on their current nature. Um, 
so that instead of just saying, um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this now, um, it's scientific because it takes into account the way that things are and the way that the way that things are has been developed, um, and it can be practiced. Whereas other ideologies, like uh, like a utopian ideology, like what Engels is pointing to, uh, can't actually be put into practice because they're rooted in the idea of idealism. They're rooted in this notion that our thoughts shape society, and therefore doing things is secondary at best or unnecessary. Um, but materialist dialectics um, and materialist socialism, scientific socialism, uh, can be practiced because of the way that it examines how things progress and develop. Um, so, for instance, we know that uh, we know that if you plant a seed and it's in certain conditions, the seed can turn into a tree or some other kind of plant. Um, maybe an idealist interpretation of this that isn't scientific would be that seeds turn into trees. Um, but if you look at the nature of that and how a seed progresses, that's actually not true. A seed doesn't turn into a tree, except in given circumstances. So if you take a seed and step on it, it's not going to turn into a tree. If you take a seed and put it in the ground and water it and give the leaves sunlight, it will turn into a tree. And that's how, um, that's where that distinction is between utopian socialism and scientific socialism. Okay. Following from that, is it okay if I try to throw out maybe another little challenge yeah, sure. that because the way that you described Engels seems to approach it is kind of uh, the difference between utopian and scientific socialism is that utopian is purely idealistic, right, and kind of doesn't put a lot of focus on action, mm. correct? Whereas the scientific isn't scientific in the usual empirical sense of the term, but is scientific in that it gives an in, in that it is an analytical tool, correct? Yeah, yeah, because actually um, Marxism is, and this surprises a lot of people because it's supposed to be scientific, it's anti-empiricist, um, because empiricism is uh, what we would call mechanism as opposed to dialectics. So mechanism basically just means looking at how a thing has a whole bunch of parts um, and how those parts make a thing. But a dialectical process examines all of the contradictions and relationships between those parts. Um, so we don't just take individual empirical facts, but we have to analyze them in connection with one another. Um, okay. That would be the difference with uh, with how it's a science, as opposed to the common conception of what a science is. Okay. With that conception, it can certainly, it's certainly clear why Engels would consider the scientific... Scientificness? That's not a term. But the, Scientificity. <laughs> yeah. Of his socialism, socialism is preferable to the utopian socialism. But how would you respond if someone were to take an idealist approach that includes action, such as kind of flipping it around and saying that, you know, we can conceive of these things as different parts, but it is primarily ideas, that ideas can be units of social analysis as opposed to the material factors, kind of flipping it around so instead of saying that it is the material things that influence our thoughts and that that is kind of like the driving forces of history right which is why marxism kind of focuses on the class conflict because that is the purely that is the physical re well f representation isn't the best word but basically like the embodiment of these material economic processes at the foundation level of society right mm. what if somebody were to flip that and say but aren't we historical creatures in the sense that we are influenced by how we think and that it is our conceptions of ideas that drive us, such as the fact that kind of what you said, like a lot of Marxism is kind of kind of like how you emphasize that Marxism itself is the process of a kind of evolving understanding of dialectics. Um, I would look at this idea that um, ideas drive us as being half of the base superstructure kind of dynamic. Okay. That would be the superstructure idea of, the, of the, the culture and the social aspects and the mental aspects of the material world. Um, but inevitably, if, if a person is using that kind of argument um, to work toward action, then it is, it is dialectical materialism because they're looking at a historical development um, and how it's shaped our culture, which in itself is actually a material thing. I mean, ideas aren't, um, 
these things that float around. They don't yeah. fall from the sky. They come from our, our experiences historically and, and presently. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a non-materialist approach. Okay. I would say that that's, um, that's the idea half of the materialist approach. Okay. What is, obviously, as you kind of said, there were splits before in Marxist thought, correct? Yeah. And uh, Marxist-Leninist Maoism is one theoretical approach, obviously the one that the RSM takes. What is the reasoning for rejecting other approaches to Marxism? So I know, spoil. well, this isn't a spoiler alert, but behind the scenes we're ripping across the veils of ideology here. But we have personally had conversations about Slavoj Žižek, who's one Marxist thinker, who certainly isn't an Orthodox communist. Mm. And there's other... Trotsky, for example, was a historical one. Uh, I don't know your opinions on Che Guevara, but he was kind of a thing of Fidel Castro. What is the reason for these splits, and why is... What is the foundation for claiming that the Maoist interpretation specifically is more valid than alternative conceptions of Marxism? Um, a lot of it would be historical experience, like um, the first successful socialist revolution was led by Lenin, um, and so that kind of validated Leninism as a higher form of Marxism. Um, and this kind of comes into contradiction sometimes because Trotsky was... Um, was the leader of the army at that point. Um, so technically speaking, he would have led, uh, led these kinds of successes into fruition. But um, if, if my memory serves me correctly, actually, Trotsky voted against the idea of the insurrection because he thought uh, he had this constant argument that the revolutionary moment hasn't happened yet, so the insurrection can't happen. So he actually, as an army general, incorrectly voted against the idea that ended up working. Um, and going further into that, he had ideas like uh, the idea of permanent revolution, um, which is just that the revolution needs to be constantly pushed outward with with war or with essentially what would almost work out as imperialism um, in order to just constantly create socialism everywhere else and that you can't have a sort of bulwark of socialism in one state, um, which Lenin and Stalin, I think, eventually proved to be uh, incorrect. Um and also, if we look at Trotskyist ideas, they've never really gotten outside of a, a talking situation. Uh, they've never been put into action as Trotskyist ideas. Um, Maoism, so far, has been um, the highest stage of Marxist thinking at this point, simply because of the fact that um, Maoist practices have been used somewhat successfully in so many places. Um, so right now, actually, recently in, in Nepal... They're um, really going forward with their revolution right now. They've sort of set up almost a, a dual government system at this point and are saying that they're going to uh, defend this new state that they've set up. Um, so just from, from historical experience, um, it was first Leninism that was the correct form of Marxism. And at this point, I would sort of phrase it as Maoism is the most correct form of Marxism-Leninism. One thing that seems to get people uncomfortable with discussions of Marxism is obviously the topic of violence and people disliking talk of revolution. Mm. However, I know that a lot of Marxists would come back and point to the violence of capitalist societies that aren't as explicit. How would you describe one violence because there are as we've kind of seen, sometimes there are definitions of words in Marxist terms that are a little bit different from the more ordinary parlance, ideology and scientific being one we already did. How would you describe the idea of violence in Marxist thought, including how it applies to a capitalist society, and kind of res using that respond to criticisms coming your way? Um, well, I would, if we look at this... Um as a contradiction within the term violence itself. Um, like you pointed out, there is violence within the capitalist system that a lot of people um, turn a blind eye to or that they would outright support. Um, for instance, um, even people who might criticize police violence would say that the police force shouldn't itself be criticized because it needs to exist in our society. And that is um, 
implicitly as support for the capitalist system of violence because the police force has emerged from that system um, and they they uphold one another um, so what we would say is that there is uh, unjust or maybe reactionary violence that upholds capitalism and oppresses people but that um, inevitably because of the experiences that people have with that there will also be um, there will also be revolutionary or justifiable violence against the people who are unjustly hurting people. Um, so even outside of a sort of moralistic justification of it, um, it's something that happens and it is understandable. Um, and it's kind of a, what is the phrase that we use? It's the, uh, the anger of the masses, the spontaneous reactions of the masses that we kind of need to harness in order to work against capitalism. Um, so as opposed to a sort of absolutist moral stance that a lot of people would use where they say um, such and such a thing is inherently immoral, violence is inherently immoral, or stealing is inherently immoral, or something like that. Um, we look at it dialectically and look at what kind of violence or theft exists in capitalism, and is the opposing thing contradicting that in a way that might actually help people. Um, for instance, I would actually argue, if, if we want to go from a moralistic standpoint, that if you see a person um, being unjustly hurt, like let's say you say racist violence, uh, you, you, we witness an act of racist violence, and you consciously make the moral decision that you won't intervene personally because your violence would be just as incorrect, um, you're upholding the violence that's happening in your actions because you might have the power to end this thing with, with your own physical force or something. Um, but you're choosing not to do so because you want to distance yourself from the situation. So, I I really find that kind of interesting because myself I have thought, you know, the I like how you pointed out a more absolutist conception of violence that you see a lot of people have, whereas I come from a political science background. And one of the famous quotes in political science is Max Weber's kind of definition of the state like the state has a legitimate monopoly on the use of violence and you know obviously any state or really it seems like a lot of political conceptions depend on some idea of violence so I think and I think you kind of hinted at something interesting there that maybe we can come out why is and maybe I, I'm sure this will come back to the dialectic because dialectic, it always comes it always back does. to the dialectic but why can you make this distinction if you're not taking an absolutist approach that revolutionary violence is justified whereas the if i can take a more if i can take a contradictory thing a more orderly or established stabilizing violence of the current system is not what is it about communism that allows this violence a revolutionary violence against oppressors to be possible and i think i know where you'd come with that but um, well, essentially, we would we would say that the violence of the state, uh, like like you said with Weber, um, that they have a I would say a self legitimized use of violence. Um, it's not so much that um, communism. Uh, oh, can you say that part again um, about communism uh, justifies the use of violence or something? Kind of, uh, kind of like if we're. Rejecting an absolutist, violence is not good, violence is mm. bad, whatever. If a state has a has the even self-legitimized monopoly on the use of violence and has to be violent, but violence isn't inherently bad or not, why would communist violence, a revolutionary violence against the state, why would you be able to make the distinction between that type of violence to create a new society versus the violence put forward by the existing state to keep order and structure in society. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I will try to answer this dialectically, but first I'll kind of use, I'll have to use a couple of mechanistic terms. If we look at kind of the cause and the effect of these different things, um, the cause of violence in capitalism is the exploitation of people for profit. Um, and so that violence upholds that system of, of exploitation, and so the effect of the violence is more capitalism and more violence, therefore. Um, but if we look at revolutionary violence, 
it's um, it's a very minimal form of violence because um, capitalist violence is against the vast majority of working people and uh, and oppressed races and women and all this sort of thing. Um, but revolutionary violence from a communist standpoint is only directed really against the small minority of people who benefit from that or who are going to defend that system. Um, so it's less violence, um, first of all, if we want to kind of look at it in terms of numbers, um, but also the effects of it are such that eventually, as long as this violence can be put to end, whether it's because the, uh, the capitalist enemy surrenders or because they're removed, um, then the violence is no longer necessary. So I kind of phrase it as uh, it's a war against war. It is violence to end violence. Okay. In what way would maybe kind of justify that final statement? Because I think that that's a very important statement and one that a lot of this rests upon. Mm. How would a communist state be able to end violence, or is it possible to have a completely non-violent society, or would it would there always be a kind of violence, especially maybe this is where we can get in with cultural revolution, which is another important Marxist concept. Mm. Is there an end to this process, or is it always constantly a battle of some kind with an underlying um, thread of anti-reactionary violence, to use the term? The, the idea behind uh, communism is that communism is a classless society, so the economic classes that exploit or are exploited are eliminated um, by removing private property and the other things that, uh, that allow that exploitation to happen. It's a, a stateless society, um, and this is the important part where the idea of, of nonviolence actually comes in, which is that in a socialist state, um, violence is only used against the reactionary forces and never or not usually in an offensive way, only in a defensive way to defend the socialist state and its people, um, or to defend other peoples of other states from similar capitalist violence. Um, so essentially the communist state can actually, or the, I'm using a contradiction of terms, a communist society can only exist once there is no basis for states and classes. Um, so I believe it was Marx who phrased it this way, that um, the communist society will be established when all of the special bodies of armed forces um, no longer have an enemy to fight because they only have other socialist states around, and they're actually able to dismantle the armed forces um, So because there simply is no more violence to fight against. Um, so it's really not that communism necessitates violence. It is that communism necessitates the end to violence. Interesting. Mm. Uh, is there anything that we should touch upon just because we're running out of time here? Maybe, uh... oh yeah, maybe this is one that would be interesting, because obviously we mentioned before how a lot of Marxist thought originates in Hegel. Mm. And Hegel has this, well, influence the idea of the end of history, right? That history is coming to a culmination that you see with Marxist thought as well, with the eventual development of a communist society, a stateless, classless society. Mm. Would you say that there is an actual end of history in the sense that this, uh, you know, stateless, classless society can be established and once there it will be that it will kind of continue or is there a possibility for these anti-communist forces to reestablish themselves kind of like obviously well maybe you can correct me on this but you know I think in angles with the private property the origin of the family private property and what's the state that? and the state how we kind of starts off with this more communal conception of society, right? The, this very primitive one mm. that eventually led to the establishment of, like, the foundations of what would dialectically turn into the capitalist system we have now. Is there an end to history with communism, or is there the potential for this process to start over again? 
Um, the term end of history is a bit confusing. Yeah. Um, I think that what it, it, what they're kind of pointing to is the end of this historical era Process. of of capitalism. Okay. Um, but obviously history, as long as humans exist, history will continue to develop. So I would say that as long as... Perhaps... Um, as, so, oh, yeah, sorry. Maybe, maybe we can clarify then the end of history referring to the end of a historical process leading up to... Up to communism. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that perhaps, um, like you pointed out with anti-communist forces um, in an actual post-state communist society, um, I'm not certain that there would be a basis for them anymore. Like, if we look at um, ideas and the actions of people as being products of, of the material world, um, if we have a society where production is automated, people barely need to work, and they are automatically given the things that they need to survive, food, water, housing, etc., um, I don't necessarily see where the basis for anti-communism would exist. Um, You'd almost have to argue that people are inherently evil or something in order for that to happen, especially if um, if socialist states continued to exist a little while after the period of the end of, of um, war against capitalism just to ensure the elimination of anti-communism as an ideology. Um, as long as all those conditions are met, I don't think that we would see a return of... Uh, of anti-communism under a, a purely communist society, just in the same way that we don't necessarily see um, Greek society being on the rise because we've we've developed our society to such a point that uh, that people don't really want to wear togas and <laughs> live outside all the time. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I think that's all the time we have. Once again, thank you, Nova, for coming on and talking with us. Absolutely. Good talking with you. Good to have it.